This afternoon, we're really um, lucky to have um, Ilan Pepe coming to speak with us. Um, he's a historian from Exeter University and the author of a range of really brilliant publications on Palestine, including his most recent book, Our Vision for Liberation, um, and many other books. These will be for sale at the end of the meeting, and Ilan has said that he can stick around for a while to, um, to sign copies. Um, so please, you know, make use of that. Um, Elon's going to speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll be opening up for discussion. So, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it's okay if, uh, can you hear me in the back? I hope you don't mind me sitting down. We are equal, you sit down, I sit down. So we are all egalitarians. Um, I had a different uh, title actually uh, uh, planned for me for this uh, session, which was the origins of the Israeli apartheid state. And I thought after so many years, well, by now 40 years, of explaining what Zionism is all about, what Israel is all about, I'm a bit tired to repeat it again and again. And I know this is a very knowledgeable uh, audience that doesn't need uh, explanation of the nature of Zionism uh, and nowadays the nature of the state of Israel. So I'd rather decided to share with you uh, a very exciting project that uh, my friend uh, and colleague Ramzi Baroud and I were engaged with uh, in the last three or four years but which actually was accelerated by the events in May 2021 in what we like to call the, uh, intifada, the Unity Intifada or the Intifada of the Unity. Uh, 11 days in May where Palestinians from all over uh, historical Palestine and in the refugee camps and the exilic community uh, together uh, showed solidarity with the people of Gaza of Sheikh Jarrah in uh, Jerusalem and other current victims of Israeli policies of ethnic cleansing, uh, oppression, and occupation. The reason we, we looked at uh, a different project was A, to highlight the agency of Palestinians in all this struggle and uh, claim that not only in those 11 days in May Palestinians were showing resilience, resistance, uh, as might be kind of gleaned from the way uh, those 11 days were rightly glorified and referred to, in fact, in the speeches today in the panel just before uh, uh, this one. Uh, I, I think there were about 10 uh, references to those 11 days in May, which is very important, but sometimes can give you the impression that apart from those 11 days in May, Palestinians were not uh, involved in resistance. And uh, one uh, important thing that we, we noticed that the difference between those 11 days that really galvanized us and soothed us and encouraged us and the daily business of resistance and resilience the, the main difference was that in many parts of the year, resistance by Palestinians and resilience is a very lonely project of the individual. Uh, because the Zionist movement succeeded in fragmenting the Palestinians to different communities, to different localities, and because so many Palestinians uh, became refugees, not only in 1948. Many of them became refugees after 1948. And there's still a new wave of Palestinian refugees, as we speak, coming out of the West Bank because of the Israeli ethnic policies in the south of Mount Hebron and in the Jordan Valley and the greater Jerusalem area. That because this is continuing, and people find themselves in exilic refugee conditions, 
And not everyone is associated with the political movement. Not everyone uh, can be uh, uh, linked to the Palestinian Liberation Organization or to any of the more established Palestinian political parties. Because of that, we tend to forget the important struggle, an intensive struggle, to survive, but also to resist that Palestinians conduct and have been conducting over the years since the moment they were exiled, occupied, or ethnically cleansed. And we decided to look for the, those Palestinians, among the many other uh, Palestinians who are daily engaging with resistance and resilience, uh, we were looking for the people who were uh, articulate in particular, namely people whose profession or their tendency is to articulate their thoughts in a very clear way, uh, either as writers, as playwrights, as poets, uh, as fiction writers, as academics, as journalists, not because we thought that the other members of the Palestinian society have nothing to tell us, but we knew that in, in a matter of a project that wants to highlight the individual contribution to resistance, it is good to go to those who find it easier maybe than others to express themselves in writing. And by doing that, first of all, we were impressed, although we're, maybe intuitively we knew this, but we were impressed at the human capital that exists among Palestinians, wherever they are. Um, one of the people we approach is a footballer from Chile. I don't know if you know, but in Chile, there is the largest Palestinian community in the world, apart from Palestine, the largest in the world. More than 600,000 Palestinians live in Chile. And they have their own football club called Club Club Palestina. Uh, well, actually, for those who are interested in football, it's a very good football club. <laughs> they have uh, reached once or twice the final of the equivalent to the European uh, uh, competitions uh, over here. And one of the young Palestinian uh, footballer uh, who also writes poetry and fiction is one of our contributors. And you can see that for him, uh, a third generation maybe of Palestinians in Chile, for him the struggle of liberation takes form maybe in an unexpected part of life on the football pitch against uh, or in front of audiences and media, and his very strong sense of commitment that despite the glory that goes along with being a, a football in a very good football club, he believes that every day what he does reflects his commitment to Palestine and resistance to the occupation and dispossession of the Palestinians. And we went all over the world to the refugee camps of Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. We went as far as New Zealand and Australia, and as I mentioned, Chile, and up to the north. We were flooded with excellent essays by Palestinians of all ages, of all genders, who uh, were very happy to tell us what the struggle for liberation means to them on a daily basis. And how do they use their own professional career, if they have one, or their own qualities as writers to contribute to this effort of uh, resistance? <clears throat> For me, this is a very inspiring experience, if, because sometimes we do, which is naturally, lose hope. Because for so many years, nothing changes in Palestine. If anything does change on the ground, it's for the worse and not for the better. But to know that generation after generation, on an individual basis, sometimes in very, very difficult uh, surroundings, as we hear actually from many Palestinians who wrote to us from the West, of how difficult they had it in elementary school, in high school, 
in the public domain to talk openly about their identity, about their support for Palestine, and we were em impressed by their resilience nonetheless, not to give up and to contain uh, whatever animosity was directed towards them to continue this uh, struggle. So one first thing that we found, which really, really impressed us, is the presence of a human capital, I call it, of committed, brilliant young Palestinians and older Palestinians that uh, are there were able to express in writing what Palestine means for them, their life story, and the connection between their individual case and the larger cause of the liberation uh, of Palestine. I don't think anyone did it uh, before uh, with such a span in order to show how geographically and generation-wise there is a lot to be proud of if you are a Palestinian or you're a supporter of Palestine, and a lot to be hopeful for, given the fact that this, these people exist and are not giving up on the struggle. The second issue or second conclusion we came, for, we, we came to from working with these stories relate more to the older generation that contributed to our uh, project of speaking for Palestine uh, through authentic Palestinian voices. And this goes back to the horror of 1948, on the one hand, and the Palestinian ability to liberate themselves from these horrors and struggle for a better future. I think many psychiatrists would tell you that the important thing with, when you deal with a trauma is to realize on the one hand that you cannot undo trauma. It's, or you cannot undo a traumatic event. We cannot undo the Nakba. We cannot uh, undo the fact that Palestine was destroyed ecologically, geographically, culturally, economically by the Zionist forces through nine months in 1948. That half of Palestine's population became refugees, half of its villages were demolished, most of its towns were destroyed. Uh, we cannot undo that trauma. We can also only now realize that with that destruction came an end to endless careers of people in Palestine that could have become uh, bankers, workers, teachers, poets, filmmakers, uh, and create a, a Palestine, a post-mandatory Palestine, that probably would have been a paragon state that would have influenced for the good the rest of the Arab world, which did not happen. All this, and this we'll find out on these stories, that so much of this human capacity to organize, to work, to produce, that was meant to be the engine that was supposed to take Palestine into the 1950s, into the 1960s, into the 21st century. All this energy was going elsewhere. This energy built the educational system in Kuwait. This energy built the educational system in Iraq. This energy uh, supported the production of modern culture of traditional music and modern music all over the Arab world, instead of being invested in Palestine for the Palestinians, and again, in a project that would have really influenced the Arab world as a whole. So the, the other aspect of the story, you can see the life that was cut in 1948, and I think you get even a deeper understanding of the meaning of the 1948 catastrophe, and the resilience of people to take themselves and reinvent themselves and build their life again, sometimes in the very dire circumstances of a refugee camp in Lebanon, Jordan, or Syria. This, uh, this energy of liberation, either by the younger generation 
or by the older uh, generation probably is best epitomized by the various stories we have of the political prisoners of Palestine. We were able to reach some of the political prisoners even when they were still in prison, using all kinds of methods to bring us their peace to the book, which is quite incredible because as you probably know, the Israeli censorship on, uh, on the political prisoners is very, very uh, uh, tough and very severe. But nonetheless, we succeeded in getting some of these stories. And everything you can think about a Palestinian in London, uh, 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 in Nablus, in Detroit, or in Santiago, of course, pales in comparison when you hear the story of resilience and resistance for someone who has been five or six years in a prison without a trial, without even knowing what the allegation against them is. Most of the political prisoners of Palestine are still imprisoned without going through a trial under British colonialist emergency regulations that the Israelis adopted that they tell the world allows them to uh, incarcerate people without a trial and without even telling them what are the allegations brought against them. And these prisoners are uh, uh, right and you can see how they're not losing their humanity in front of the inhumanity that faces them and how they are imagining a liberated Palestine, how they're dreaming of a decolonized Palestine, and how they believe that every day they are doing something towards the implementation, realization uh, uh, of those uh, dreams. Um, what we, we found and that's the third thing that we found, and maybe that was natural, but I think it should be highlighted. Many of the stories we have are, are of people who could have made a different choices in their life because they were very capable as journalists, as businessmen, uh, as filmmakers. And they had to make a choice where they understood it didn't matter where, where they lived that if they decide to fuse their activism for liberation with their professional career, they will pay a price. They will pay a price in terms of maybe standard of living, maybe of a salary, maybe even of a successful career. And it's very clear that with no hesitation, uh, these particular individuals always put the idea of liberation before a personal uh, career. And when they were lucky, they could use their professionalism in order to enhance the struggle of uh, uh, liberation. It's important to connect to these stories because we deal a lot, and rightly so, with the nature of Zionism, with Israeli oppression. And then you tend to think about the Palestinians all the time as victims. And it's not healthy to think about people all the time as victims, as if they have no agency and they have no way of dealing with that oppression. One of the reasons I think we are under the impression that the victimization is more important than the agency is the fact, and we have to admit it, it's one of the few liberation movements in the world that did not even liberate one square inch of its homeland. We have to accept it. Hundred, more than 100 years of liberation and not even one square inch is really liberated. And that's when you get the sense, okay, so this is a lost cause, right? I mean, if for more than 100 years you, you fight for something and it doesn't happen, all you can show is sympathy for the victims. But you, you understand through these stories that liberation and decolonization is not just territorial. It's not just about liberating land. In the 1960s and the 1970s, third world liberation movements, and rightly so, believed that the most important thing for a liberation movement is to get the colonialist power out and to, share, to show that you have sovereignty and, of, uh, and you owe the land that was colonized and taken from you. The Arab Spring, or whatever, I don't like this term, it was invented by an American journalist, and terms invented by American journalists should not be used 
It's like <laughs> caffeine, salt, and so on. They're things you don't do in life. So one shouldn't use uh, such, such terms. But whatever you want to call the events of 2011 and so in the Arab world, it was very clear that the people in the Arab world felt that the decolonization of territory was not liberation. That we are still in a long winter of decolonization uh, that has not yet matured, not just in Palestine, all over the Arab world. When it comes to issues of human rights and civil rights, the rights of minorities and so on, we are very far from saying the Arab world has been decolonized. It is still colonized in, in many, many ways. There are many people who would say, and probably rightly so, that there are still some colonialist aspects of Britain that needs to be decolonized when it comes of treating immigrants, refugees, and so on. So decolonization is probably something that should be aspired to, uh, not only in Palestine, uh, but elsewhere. But I think what, what really is important in this connection is that despite the fact that territorially, Palestine has not been decolonized, has not been liberated, and one can hope, and I, I'm sure it will one day, be liberated also in terms of sovereignty, territory, and so on. It is liberated daily by these people, in their mind, in their imagination, in their poems, in their films, in their fictions. And this is where the individual struggle for liberation becomes collective. And this is, and, and, and I, can, I know it from being in Palestine all the time, how the younger generation is moved and inspired by a poem. And sometimes I think people in Britain don't realize the power of poetry in the Arab world. Poetry is not like in Britain. It's not a festival in hay, hay on the way. <laughs> poetry for Palestinians is a way of life. It's something that you hear from the morning to, to, to night. It uh, accompanies you everywhere, in your weddings, in your funerals, in your celebrations. Uh, it's not uh, for, for um, the few who are interested in this. In any case, the poems, the fictions, the play, the plays, and so on, are the ones that in, enable you not just to imagine the decolonized Palestine, but actually live it for a day, for two or three. I am genuinely convinced that this is the greatest success of the Palestinian liberation movement so far. The greatest success is that I know that a new generation of Palestinians that was just born recently in Australia, in New Zealand, in Chile, in the United States, in Britain, all over the Arab world and in Africa, that a new generation of Palestinians uh, would know exactly where they are from, not the place where they live now, but where the family comes from. And they would know the story of the family and the story of the place they were coming from, which is also comes very strongly in the individual stories. And that they would not think about coming back to that place as a utopia, as something that their parents or their grandparents nostalgically were concocting in order to make life more interesting. No, it's a life project for them. It's a life project whether they are insisting in school of building a model of the destroyed village that the family came from, whether it is writing a fiction about how, how life would look in Palestine in 2048, 100 years after uh, the Nakba, or by making sure that whatever they do in life as a career is strongly linked and associated with working uh, for Palestine. So let's not think about the Palestinians as victims. These are incredible group of people that against a coalition that no other colonized people ever faced in the world have not been wiped out not from memory, not from the land, and not from history. And it's only when you realize the, the power of the coalition that were facing them, I think, you understand even better how admirable is their resistance and resilience. In my talk uh, in the previous panel, I mentioned that actually on this mile-end road, unfortunately, 
a project of advocacy and lobbying for Zion, a Zionist Palestine began here, here in Britain, in London. A project that brought together Christianity, Judaism, and imperialism to define Palestine as a Jewish state, even when the Jews were only 10% of the population, and most of them had no wish to be part of a Zionist state. On, at that moment in 1900, a, a, a lobbying machine, one of the biggest, richest, and strongest lobbying machine for colonizing a homeland of native indigenous people of Palestine began here in Britain and was orchestrated from Britain. First to convince the British Empire to occupy Palestine, which most British strategies in the First World War did not think was necessary. Palestine had very little to offer. Then to convince Britain that Palestine should not only be British, but should also be Jewish. And there were enough British here, people here and in Palestine who knew that Palestine was not an empty land. They knew that there was another people there, and they knew that this project would mean the dispossession of the Palestinians. That powerful coalition of Christianity, Judaism, uh, uh, imperialism, then was taken over by the United States of America. And uh, uh, into the Cold War, strengthened this uh, coalition to create this, this idea that the Judeo-Christian world sees Israel as a buffer zone against Islamic barbarism. So it was based on Islamophobia. And then saying, no, this is a bastion actually against communism when the Cold War started. And after 9-11, we are back to Israel being the buffer zone against Islamophobia, the, the danger of Islam, or the whole idea of the clash of civilization of Samuel Huntington. If you are a Palestinian, you are facing the desire of Christians, Jews, imperialists, capitalists, to turn Palestine into something it is not to lobotomize it out of the Arab world, out of the Muslim civilization, and create something there that cannot be sustained, is unjust, and affects negatively the whole region, and I would say even the world. The fact that against this powerful uh, coalition, Palestinians, wherever they are, men and women, show resilience and don't lose hope should make all of us committed members of the Palestine Solidarity Movement, and I don't mean one organization, I mean the movement as a whole, uh, uh, on, on the same level of commitment and resilience as they do on their daily life. Thank you.
I keep on saying the pink wristband, but everyone's got that. <laughs> So some of the things Elam's been saying is indicative of a shift that's happened in the Palestine movement, I think, in the last 10 years amongst Palestinians. Whereas 10 years ago, most Palestinians in the movement would identify with one of the parties, so Fatah or Hamas or some of the left with PFLP or DFLP. And I think there's a new generation for whom this is no longer the case. So Fatah is associated completely with the Palestine, or Palestine Authority of uh, managing uh, the West Bank, Hamas similarly, in, um, in, in Gaza, and the left parties haven't really filled, it, filled in the space. And so what we're having, which is new, is a whole horde of Palestinians, both inside Palestine and in the, in the, in the diaspora, who aren't organized in the same, or don't, who don't have the same identification with, politi with political parties, as, ha as happened that, and I think this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing because the old parties aren't fit to service, certainly for that, it's no longer, it's no longer fit to service, and the move for people away from that, and saying we want to organise on, uh, amongst, that, amongst ourselves, is a, is a, is a, is a, step, is a, a step in the direction towards um, more movement from below in, in Palestine. But it does mean, of course, the we have all the cultural histories that I talked about, which is incredibly important, but this doesn't necessarily have an organisational, uh, it, it, it's not shown organisation in it. A little of the old Leninist in me kind of wants a bit of people to come together and organise it, to, to have a, a political alternative, not just to Israel, but, but, to, but, but to the old parties. Um, there's an anecdote about 10, 15 years ago, I was. Um, and was sent on a mission to Palestine to build contacts between the Western left and al a small Palestinian left, or it's a Palestinian left organization who works with Ilan on the One Democratic State campaign. And the hope was, hey, find the European left can talk to Palestinian left and build something together. The success of my mission was such that they, they had a major split while I was in Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there has been this kind of, there the, the, the has, the, the, the has been a, a that people seeing the need for something different, a different sort of leadership. But the organisational the organisational side of it seems to still be missing a bit. I guess I'm kind of asking Elon to tell me I'm wrong. So there are these, a bit like the like pigs. But what are the hopes really of um, something new in which people are coming together to offer not just artistic resistance but an organised political resistance to what's on offer? Um, all right, the comrade just down here in the first row. Um, yeah. No, this row here, so second row. No, yeah, sorry, yeah, I have you. You're down. You will be. Yeah, it's this person. Yeah, yeah it's you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, thanks, Elan, for a great talk, and uh, I can't wait to read the book now. And I, I, I have to say, um, yeah, I'm very struck by your idea of sort of an imaginative decolonization. Uh, and I don't know if it strikes, it certainly it sort of strikes bells for me being from Ireland uh, and the parallels in terms of the decolonization process and the movement of liberation. I mean, famously, Ronald Storrs, the Governor General of Jerusalem, said in 1936, we want to create a loyal little Ulster amongst, amongst the sea of Arabism. Uh, so they very consciously, often the same individuals who've been involved in subjugating the Irish Revolution in the previous decades, models the apartheid system they were about to set up with penal laws that had been imposed in Ireland and that had led to the famine, the 50% of the population being essentially eliminated uh, between the beginning of the 19th century and the, the famine in the mid-period. Mid but a huge part, even when Ireland had not liberated an inch, as you put it, and had faced hundreds of years, including a famine and devastation and so on, a, 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 a hugely important forerunner to the actual revolution was the imaginative reclamation and decolonization of Ireland through literature, through music, through art, through poetry. It absolutely, literally kept alive the identity of the country as the British periods had sought to destroy it. And it was critical in being a sort of spark of the revolutionary movement, which actually then finally did liberate territory in the uh, in the revolutionary period. So I, I just think you're so right uh, to see it, because often not only do we see people as victims, uh, but uh, 
we also see political action as just, and these are terribly important, as just the protests and the strikes uh, and the armed resistance uh, and so on. But certainly in the Irish uh, revolutionary uh, movement, that literary, artistic, poetic, musical, sports, uh, the Gaelic League, for example, these were critical parts of the liberation process and that laid the foundations uh, of the revolutionary uh, struggle that uh, took place. And even, you know, little things like the football, I'm a big football fan, we brought a young team of footballers from Gaza to uh, Dublin and it was just fantastic because it got into working class communities an understanding of the terrible suffering of the people in Gaza in a way that all the political speeches in the world wouldn't have and created solid bonds of solidarity between working class communities across uh, Ireland with the people of Gaza and uh, an understanding of what had been taken from the people of Palestine. Uh, so it's not a substitute for all the other stuff, but it is a critical accompaniment and I, I commend you for, uh, for putting forward that idea. The ideological role that Israel plays within the region, um, and really from its creation, how it's played that role, I think it's really important because a lot of the times, you know, what we're told that well, the fundamental Zionist belief is that anti Semitism is like endemic within societies, and therefore people need to um, assimilate and have their own uh, now. Now, first of all, we see, um, I don't believe that's true, I don't think any form of racism is endemic or natural, I think it can always be fought away. But, Actually, the creation of Israel and the Zionist project was never really about escaping the anti-Semitism that Jews face predominantly in, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. I mean, actually, from the words, uh, well, from the from the mouth of the man who was a sort of theoretician of Zionism, Michael Theodor Herzl, um, he wrote when he wrote for advice to Michael Cecil Rhodes, which I'm sort of people have heard of in this room, um, you know, the horrible racist colonialist who ruled over what was ever in and he actually wrote to Cecil Rhodes, I just want to get you a quote, um, saying, you are being invited to help make history. This cannot frighten you, because it does not involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor. Not Englishmen, but Jews. I turn to you because it is something colonial. So I mean, when anyone says that the state of Israel is about anything but colonialism and imperialism, I mean, that is like, comes from the belly of the beast. And I think, you know, you see it today as well with what Elam was saying about how Israel is now portrayed as a sort of buffer zone. First, you know, in the 70s with most of the revolutions and so on in Iran about against communism and now against the sort of threat of, um, you know, of, of Arab nations and the Iran and Islamophobia that we're seeing hyped up in society. And I think that is the effect of what imperialism is, isn't it? Because sometimes we think imperialism is like an overarching structure that sort of looks down on things, but that's not how it works. It completely soaks into the country that is that is colonised. It is part of every single aspect of life, from the ideological roles that it plays in the regions to the schoolings that people have, and actually how the structures of the state um, are set up. And you can see that so clearly in the militarised nature of the state of Israel. So, I mean, when we talk about the prospects for Palestinian liberation and the things that Elan laid out about you know, these sort of creative ideas of looking, you know, beyond the Palestinian authority, authorities, when I was saying that, I went to a meeting at a university and a Palestinian student was there and he said to me, he was like, we're not just oppressed actually by the Israeli state, um, we're also suppressed by the PA, we're under two, you know, occupying forces. And actually the fact that young people are looking outside those things is something that we should celebrate because actually we know that the solution to Palestinian liberation cannot lie within the borders of Israel because Israel has no limitation, has no room actually for Palestinians to get any liberation. And just to finish with really, I mean, in the same year that there was the first uh, Zionist conference in 1897 in Basel. If you can start um, up here. Yeah, just in that same year, um, a small group of Jewish socialists met in Russia with the Bund and they thought actually to fight anti-Semitism you needed to join Bolshevik revolution and I think Please that's actually the way it's right for us. And then, sorry, I should be saying who's after, and then followed by the comrade in glasses, sorry. Two glasses, black shirt and glasses, yeah. Yeah, bye. 
question is a short one, not really a rhetorical question, which is um, if um, apartheid South Africa can be banned from international sports and um, Russia can be banned from international sports, why can't Israel be banned from international sports? Shirt and glasses, thanks. And then that will be followed by denim shirt. Denim. Thank you. I want to thank you. Um, it's brilliant, Sophia. And I think you're absolutely right when you said about the, the fights uh, for decolonisation isn't just for the Palestinian people, it's for everyone across the whole planet. We all must be fighting that. And you can see it, you know, the people who are really benefiting from Israel and always have done, people have said it's the you know, Western imperialism, it's America, the people, it's not the Israeli. Israeli state on its own, it's very much the, the, driven by the, by the interests of imperialism and by capitalism. And you can see that if you look at imperialism, you get very clear, there's also Russian imperialism, so I'm absolutely opposed to the, the invasion of, of Ukraine, but you can see what's going on in Ukraine. President Zelensky said, and offered up back in May, we will become a big Israel for Western imperialism. He offered himself up for Ukrainian people to become another outpost like Israel has been. Western imperialism, and we can see that fight going on there. So that means the fight isn't just about in Palestine, it means the fight against the war and NATO rearmament and escalation of potential nuclear war in this country. So the fight for imperialism is also about taking on Boris Johnson, uh, who, you know, his, not only army Israel, they're arming uh, Saudis who are fighting a brutal war in Yemen and the rest of it, but it's also a fight against what's going on in the Labour Party. People like Starmer are pers persecuting people who stand up for Palestine. I mean, spelled good socialists have been boosted out of the, the Labour Party. You need to be, I would say, if you really want to draw the links around the international fight against imperialism, the international fight against capitalism, you need to join a party that is internationalist and is anti-capitalist. And that's, in my opinion, the Socialist Workers' Party. And I really encourage people, if they're not already a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, please do join us. about uh, Palestinian people going in other countries and, uh, and bringing value there. Yes, we have, uh, I mean, our emergency service basically was uh, founded and organized by uh, a Palestinian doctor, Ray Arnold. So we owe great, great, uh, great debt to Palestinian people for, especially now with the pandemic saving lots of our, my people's lives, like the Romanian citizens. And uh, another thing was, um, uh, was uh, well, a bit, uh, uh, I, I'm a bit worrisome about uh, how do you make, how do you liberate uh, uh, country, territory without violence? That's the, how do you plan to do that? And if it's possible, I mean, do um, you think that the current context in which, of course, the main backer, I mean, of Israel being America, is losing influence? Uh, Israel, if, if you like, uh, Israel is like America was from Britain, like the colony of, uh, of America. And if one can take advantage of this uh, in, uh, in, uh, in advance of this struggle, and uh, because I'm not sure that violence won't be excluded, as to reduce the violence that will be inflicted here. So, thank you. Thank you. 
the revolutionary socialists, joined today. We want to walk away from this festival stronger than when we arrived. And it will be very useful for all of you, whether you're a college student, a worker, wherever you come from, join the programme and get with us. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first start answering some of the questions that I do remember, and then I'll answer the questions I don't remember. Uh, uh, okay. The first one was uh, about um, a, a talk I gave here a few years ago about uh, the, the, uh, an attempt by some anti-Zionist Jews in Israel to connect to uh, Palestinian and Arab activists through the internet, transcending the borders 
and uh, uh, sharing some visions of the future. This continues. It, it bore some fruit. There is a group now of uh, young Israeli Jews who are, in a way, exercising uh, uh, the, the new vocabulary and getting used to it and trying to see what political implications it would have. Uh, and this has a lot to do also with the development of Palestine studies all over the world. Uh, so talking about Zionism as settler colonialism, talking about Israel as an apartheid state, of course, very much helped by the amnesty report referring to Israel as an apartheid state, uh, all brought, brings to the fore a new language. I mean, a language for, uh, the Palestinians are familiar with, but is, is quite new for uh, uh, Israeli Jewish uh, activists. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is something that will grow. I don't want to under exaggerate its, its importance or, or kind of uh, uh, make it bigger than it is, but I think it is an important uh, uh, contribution. Um, one has to wait and see how significant it will be in the overall um, struggle uh, for Palestine. Then there was a question about uh, the BDS. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that we are now facing so many attempts to uh, legislate against it, uh, that Israel is uh, recruiting governments uh, and uh, international companies to try and uh, uh, stifle the debate over Israel and silence supports for the, for the BDS uh, is a testimony for the success of this uh, campaign. Otherwise, they would not have made uh, the effort. It means that they uh, see it as uh, an indication that the solidarity with Palestine in the world is not just words, but also action. And, and I think this is very, a very important message uh, to the Israelis, that there is a price tag attached uh, to their uh, policies. And even if governments are afraid or for whatever reasons are not willing to make Israel pay for its policies, there are large sections of the civil society that have their own way of making Israel aware of the price tag uh, that is attached to its uh, policy. So I, I think it's a very successful uh, movement. Uh, it will grow. I'm sure it will grow. Uh, it's a very democratic movement. So there are very many ways of implementing your ideas of, of BDS. Uh, but uh, I think it will play a very important role uh, uh, allowing people to be on the right side of history when it comes uh, uh, to Palestine. Uh, Phil, uh, uh, I, I don't want, and this also, I think, connects to, to nonviolence. I didn't mean that these personal struggles of resilience and resistance are substitute for a liberation movement. They're not. But because of the history of Palestine, because of the objective reality in which Palestinians uh, uh, act and have to act politically, there are long periods of time where we know from history and we know from the present there's an absence of a proper movement. There's an absence of proper democratic, authentic institution representing the Palestinian people and aspiration. And unfortunately, sometimes there is an absence of proper organizational infrastructure to make sure that there is a synergetic uh, uh, power to all the discrete Palestinian groups that are working together. What I'm trying to say is that in these moments, there is still resistance. There is still resilience. Uh, the Palestinian community in the world, wherever it is, it's the youngest in the world. 50% of the Palestinians, wherever they are, are under 18. There's a new generation of Palestinians that if you browse uh, wisely enough in the internet, you can hear them. Sometimes you can even see them. And uh, they have, you're absolutely right, they are not particularly enthused about party affiliations, political affiliations to that or other group. They don't regard imagining the future as a utopia, but rather as political activism. They actually defeat anyone who would say, like me in a lecture, unfortunately, the Palestinian people are disunited. Actually, when you, you read them, you say they're not disunited. 
but they, they agree about what the problem is and they're totally in consent about the future. They want to live in a democratic, liberated, decolonized Palestine, which will allow all the refugees to come back. That's a very united vision. This is not a disunited vision. I agree, however, that to carry this vision forward, there will be a need to build an infrastructure, organizational infrastructure. I'm part of the movement for one democratic state in Palestine, by many Palestinians, several Jews, thank God, more than one. And, uh, and, and, and that's part of what we are trying to do. So either this will be done within existing Palestinian institution, maybe there will be a new Palestinian institution, it's up to the Palestinians to decide exactly what will carry the Palestinian liberation movement into the future. It's very clear that the 21st century liberation of decolonization will be different from the liberation effort in the 1970s. The world has changed. There are new facts on the ground in Israel itself that you have to take into account. All these things are being discussed, are being analyzed, uh, and the Palestinians, I think I was, we were trying to prove this today, the Palestinians are capable of doing it. Solidarity doesn't mean that you will tell them what to do. They know what they want to do. They want you to help them, not to tell them what to do. That's very important. The first lesson of solidarity. It's very important. Not, sometimes it's not easy because, because you, you, you see things that may irritate you and so on. But uh, believe me, this is an incredible group of people that have undergone unbearable suffering and yet they're still there despite a strong coalition that wants to uh, remove them. Finally, I, I think I more or less uh, answered the question uh, that were asked. I want to say something about uh, uh, Kashmir and, 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 and Ireland in a way because I think it's connected. Uh, many, many years ago, about 2007, I created uh, in, in Exeter the first ever academic space for uh, postgraduate students to work freely on Palestine without fear, regardless of IHRA definitions, uh, uh, pro-Israeli lobby intimidation, we survived. We survived, we still are surviving. Tech. We are growing from strength to strength. Then we cannot accept the many postgraduate students around the world that want to work on Palestine with us. I wish we had as many of them. Some of them work and compare Kashmir to Palestine. Uh, and, and the reason is that I think we are in an age of, inter and with this I will end, that also includes Ireland in a way, of intersectionality. We are more aware than ever before that struggles for liberation in Kashmir and Palestine cannot be done just by Kashmiris and not can be done just by Palestinians. But there are many settler colonial varieties in the world. Some of them belong to the old history of the empire, like in Ireland. Yeah. Some of them are new ones, like in Kashmir, where now the Indian government is trying to bring settlers into Kashmir itself. Uh, some of them are in the working places, where international cooperation treat workers as native population and uh, ex exercise on them the logic of the elimination of the native as the settler colonialist movement has exercised on people. Some of them are African Americans, some of them are Native Americans, some of them are the First Nations. There is a whole group of people in the world who are victims of settler colonialism and not giving up despite terrible chapters in their history and great successes of those who oppress them. They have to work together. It's the old idea of the solidarity of the left of the 1970s, but it's much bigger than that. And it's not just about the left. It's about the people in the world that are not getting the normal life, the natural life that they deserve and that had been robbed of them by the power of economy, ideology, sometimes religion, that uh, is supported by very powerful factors. Uh, we can together challenge these uh, powerful uh, members of the coalition and I think Palestine in that respect is a litmus paper and an example that uh, once it's liberated and decolonized would have a huge effect on the other uh, uh, struggles which have not yet come to a successful end. Thank you. <laughs>